let me ask you, just for my own interest, and it will help me, before you came to this conference, how many of you had never heard of William Chalmers Burns? Okay. Um, I often tell my students in the seminary, I actually don't know very much, but I know more than you. <laughs> but then I think, well, that's not very much, actually. Um, anyway, thank you for coming. Um, let me read very, very briefly two or three verses in Luke chapter 14. You don't need to, to turn to them. I'll pray, and then we will launch into William Chalmers Burns. Luke chapter 14 at verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied Jesus, and he turned to them and said, If anyone comes to me, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Well, let me pray, and then we'll begin. Our gracious and ever-blessed God, our Father in heaven, we come to learn of you. We come, Lord, to have our minds informed and our hearts enlarged as we consider the life of one of your eminent servants, William Chalmers Burns. We pray, Lord, that we would not simply listen, but that our lives would be marked for good, for now and for eternity, by what we learn of this servant of yours who labored so faithfully and so sacrificially for the sake of the gospel of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. You know each heart before you. Meet us, Lord, in our need this day, and we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, I feel very deeply privileged to be able today to introduce you to a man that as I've discovered, most of you uh, had never heard of. And my hope in this address is actually very, very simple. If you leave this talk thinking, I must find out more about this man, William Chalmers Burns, I will leave this conference a happy man, and you will leave with a great blessing awaiting you. Let me tell you for a moment about my first encounter with the name William Chalmers Burns. I was a young Christian. I was, I think, about 19 years of age. I hadn't long been converted. I had no Christian background, no church background. I stumbled across a book with the arresting title, Five Pioneer Missionaries, uh, published by the Banner of Truth Trust. And the five missionaries were William Chalmers Burns, missionary to China, John Gibson Payton, missionary to the New Hebrides, Vanuatu, John Elliott, 1L and 1T, missionary to the Red Indians, if you're allowed to call Indians red in these politically correct times, Henry Martin, missionary to Persia, and David Brainerd, missionary to the Indians along the Susquehanna in Pennsylvania. And I read the book enthralled, engrossed, challenged, humbled. Um, I remember reading the chapter on David Brainerd and then later reading John, Jonathan Edwards' uh, diary of David Brainerd. 
And I thought, I must be like David Brainerd. I will wake, and when I wake in the morning, whatever time it is, I'll get up. Two o'clock in the morning, I woke up. I thought, right, I must get up like David Brainerd. And I did, knelt by my bedside, and two hours later, I woke up again. <laughs> with a sore back and sore <laughs> knees. And I thought, well, maybe best to be Ian Hamilton rather than, <laughs> rather than David Brainerd, Re de Vivus. But it was the chapter on William Chalmers Burns that most impacted me. And for this reason, there was a statement in the chapter that arrested me. In those days, in the middle decades of the 19th century, um, one of the great highlights in European society would be travelers from the Orient returning to their homelands, in this case, Scotland, and giving public lectures on their experiences of the fabulous Orient, traveling you know, through Turkey, uh, Persia, uh, and, and heading out east, going to China. And they would come back and they would give lantern slides of their travels and people would be engrossed. And one man came back and gave a public lecture on China to 2,000 people in the center of Glasgow, in the St. Andrew's Hall. I can picture it yet, my high school was not far from there. Uh, I would occasionally go to classical concerts as a young boy. And this man was giving his talk on China. And at the end of the address, there was a Q&A. And one man got up and asked this question. In your travels in China, did you perchance come across a Scottish Presbyterian missionary by the name of William Chalmers Burns. And the traveler paused and he replied in words I've never forgotten. He said, know him, all China knows him. He's the holiest man alive. Now, when I read that as a very young impressionable Christian, I thought, my, what kind of man was this William Chalmers Burns? On the 15th of January, 1868, William Chalmers Burns wrote a farewell letter to his mother back in Scotland. He had been in China by this time since 1847, so 21 years he had been in China, and he wrote this letter to his mother, to my mother. At the end of last year, I got a severe chill, which has not yet left the system, producing chilliness and fever every night. And for the last two nights, this has been followed by perspiration, which rapidly diminishes the strength, unless it should please God to rebuke the disease it is evident what the end must soon be. And I write these lines beforehand to say that I am happy and ready through the abounding grace of God either to live or to die. May the God of all consolation comfort you when the tidings of my decease shall reach you, and through the redeeming blood of Jesus, may we meet with joy before the throne above. So who was this William Chalmers Burns? Who was, I believe, one of the most remarkable figures in the history, not only of the Scottish church since the Reformation, but actually, I think, in the history of the Christian church in the past 2,000 years. Well, William was the son of a Presbyterian minister. 
William Hamilton Burns. I would love to think that perhaps, perhaps, <laughs> maybe, maybe something of the DNA uh, of that family found its way to my family. His father was a Presbyterian minister. He was educated, first of all, in, in a small little village where his father was the pastor, about 40 miles north of Edinburgh. He was educated at Aberdeen Grammar School. If you know Aberdeen, it's on the northeast coast of Scotland, about 120 miles due north of Edinburgh. And he entered Aberdeen University in 1829 at the age of 14. He was an able young man. Uh, my wife went to university at 17. I went to 18. He went at 14. His early thoughts were to be a lawyer. He wanted to be noted and he wanted to be wealthy. He was a good son, but he was not yet a converted son. His father was a godly pastor, a faithful evangelical pastor in the National Church of Scotland. While he was in Edinburgh, beginning to prepare for a course of study that would ultimately lead to him being a lawyer, two things happened that transformed his life. His father sent him a book on Christian piety. And Burns tells us that when he read the book, his heart was stabbed to its core. He was confronted by truth that he had heard many, many times from his father's lips. But God was using this book to shine the light of his truth into the darkness of William's heart. He was pierced. He was convicted. And then one of his sisters wrote him a letter. And in the letter, she said to him, William, he was one of six children. William, Mama and Papa and I and your siblings are pilgrims on the way to heaven. We do not want to go there without you. And the Lord used that simple letter to powerfully bring the gospel that he had heard from a little boy, brought the gospel with saving power into his life. And he tells us that God, and he used this word, God apprehended me. It's a great word. It reminds me of Calvin. Calvin, Calvin wrote 59 volumes. And in the 59 volumes, there are only about four lines, maybe five, if depends how you count the lines, five lines where he talks about how he was brought to saving faith. The reformers were very uninterested in the pathology of conversion. If, if you were to ask a, seven, a 16th century uh, believer uh, in the gospel, um, how did the Lord bring you to Christ? Their answer would almost always be by the grace of His mercy. And they, you would say, well, would you like to tell me more? Well, what more do you need to know? <laughs> because the great concern of the reformers, and this was a strain through uh, the Scottish Reformation, through the Puritans, they, their great concern was not how did you come to faith, but are you converted? Does your life show that you've come to faith? So the idea of a testimony evening would have been just a repetition of by the grace of God, <laughs> by the grace of God, by the grace of God. So he says, God in his own sovereignty touched my heart and drew me to himself for his own glory. He apprehended me. 
a young friend a few minutes ago asked me who my favorite reformer was, and I don't have any hesitation in saying it's John Calvin. He's influenced me more than any other uninspired writer. And in the preface to his uh, Latin commentary on the Psalms, 1546, he, he's, he explains his conversion, and he says, I was sunk in popery, but God subdued me. Deus subegit. God subdued me. And William Chalmers Burns could say the same thing. God apprehended me. I retired to a bedroom there to pour out my heart for the first time with many tears in a genuine heart-rending cry for mercy. He was 16 at the time. What he did was to walk 36 miles from Edinburgh to his parents' home, the manse in the little village called Dunn, near a place called Brechin. And his mother was astonished as he walked into the kitchen. She wasn't expecting him. He had walked 36 miles. And she said, Willie, what are you doing here? And he says, Mama, what would you say if I were to become a minister of the Lord, Jesus Christ? From that moment, William Chalmers Burns was not only apprehended by God, he felt his whole life claimed by God for the work of the kingdom of God. He forgot all about the law, resumed his studies at Aberdeen University, graduated with distinction, and then he moved to the city of Glasgow, my home city, to study theology. Now, Burns was an exceptional man. He had this remarkable um, aptitude for languages. He mastered Hebrew, uh, he mastered Greek, he later became fluent enough uh, to preach in French, in Mandarin, Cantonese, various dialects, uh, and even in Scots Gaelic. And he, he was an interesting young man because in his youth and then subsequently all through his life, he had two ways of relaxing. He read the Greek classics in Greek, of course, you know, not in English translations. Those were the days when education was education. Um, in my high school in Glasgow, um, Latin and Greek were, you know, just part of the curriculum. Um, and he relaxed by reading ancient Greek classics in Greek and by sleeping. He had no false piety. He didn't think it was unspiritual to sleep. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, my four children take after their mother in that regard, not after their father. Um, I wish I could sleep better than I do. But the, the, the point I'm trying to make is there was nothing um, unreal about his piety. Um, he knew he needed sleep if he was going to be an effective servant of the Lord. Very soon, William felt an increasing burden for three things. Now, some of you will know that Martin Luther said three things make a preacher. Oratio, tentatio, and meditatio. Um, prayer and temptation and meditation. Well, for Burns, three things shaped him into a missionary a deep burden for the lost, relentless prayer, and a personal commitment to world mission. On one occasion when he had started his divinity studies, theological studies, we call them divinity studies in Scotland, um, 
He was walking through the busy streets of Glasgow, and when I read this, I could actually picture it. I'd walked along this busy thoroughfare in the center of Glasgow myriads of times. I, I knew every part of the street. It's a long street um, called Argyle Street, and it was teeming with people. And his mother saw him, oh, perhaps about, I don't know, 20, 30 yards in front of her walking towards her. But then he disappeared up an alley, and his mother found him breaking his heart, sobbing, and she said, Willie, what ails you? What ails you? And he said, Mama, just now I was so overcome with the sight of the countless crowds of immortal beings eagerly hustling hither and thither, but all posting onwards towards the eternal world. And I could bear it no longer and turned in here to seek relief in quiet prayer. When I read that, I thought of the Lord Jesus. Luke recounts for us, Luke 19 verse 41, that when Jesus drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. Joan and I lived in Cambridge for 17 years, ministered in the Presbyterian Church in Cambridge in England, great university city, teeming with people from here, there, and everywhere. Um, and how often I would find myself in the midst of teeming crowds. And my first thought to my shame was always this, could you please move out the way and let me get to where I want to go? Why have you all come here? <laughs> and then often, it's as if the Lord just put his finger and said, well, you're not William Chalmers Burns, are you? Burns became a fearless witness for Christ. Evangelism was not something he did, it was something he was. Evangelism was the the overflow of his life. You know, preaching should be the overflow of a life. Preaching should be an extension of what a man is. And evangelism, uh, as well as preaching, was just an extension of uh, William Chalmers Burns. In 1839, so he's now at the age of 24, um, he's licensed to preach by the Church of Scotland Presbytery of Glasgow. And those of you who know the name, how many of you have heard of Robert Murray McChain? Oh, well, you need to know about him. He was one of the great, great ministers in the 19th century in the church in Scotland. And the Banner of Truth published uh, a work by Andrew Bonner, um, The Memoirs and Remains of Robert Murray McChain, a very evocative 19th century title. McChain was a minister in the bustling city of Dundee, about 50 miles, 60 miles north of Edinburgh. And God had wonderfully blessed McChain's ministry. But McChain was very unwell. He, he would die actually in 1843 at the age of 29. And it was recommended that he should go to Palestine as it was called, for his health, and in doing so to um, head up uh, a committee that would explore how the church in Scotland could better evangelize the Jews. Uh, to, to show you how different the times were, McChain records in his diary, uh, today I reach Budapest. I, I was there at a conference this past year. Today I reach Budapest. I spoke with a Jewish rabbi. He spoke no English. I spoke no Magyar. So we conversed in Latin. <laughs> now, we, we think, that is amazing. If you'd said that to McChain, he would say, uh, I mean, what's so amazing about that? Any educated person can do that, which is true. <laughs> <laughs> then, if not now. Public education here and in my country is not what it once was. 
So McChain goes to the Holy Land, and to everyone's surprise, he asks this young man who's actually only two years younger than him, but he's just been licensed as a preacher. He doesn't have a settled charge. And McChain, some, for some reason, asks uh, William Chalmers Burns to fill his pulpit. And he does so. And revival, revi and I do mean revival, a remarkable awakening begins night after night, week after week, month after month, hundreds of people would come to hear William Chalmers Burns preach. We're told that the whole city was stirred, was stirred. For weeks, people crowded into the church night after night for three, four, five hours to hear Burns preach and sing. And they only sang psalms. How many of you sing psalms in your churches? Shame on you if you don't. It was the songbook of the Son of God, and it should be woven into the very fabric of Christian praise. I mustn't get distracted. <laughs> but Burns, more than anything else, gave himself to prayer. And it was said that he spent more time praying than he did preparing. Now, whatever that was, um, he spent more time praying. And as the work of God progressed, so Burns gave himself increasingly to prayer. And in prayer, he was preparing his heart for preaching. Of course, he spent time preparing his messages, but he knew that the great need was the apostolic principle. We will give ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the Word. And I think that Luke is giving us a principial pattern for gospel ministry. We will give ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the Word. So, McChain comes back from the Holy Land, and uh, Burns is released from his labors in St. Peter's Free Church of Scotland, and he, and in 1844, he goes to Canada, goes to Canada, and wherever he goes, the blessing of God is following him. It's, it's quite remarkable. I mean, I don't have time to go through all the different places he went to in Scotland and in the north of England and over to Ireland. Um, the Lord's blessing just seemed to hang like the cloud of the presence of the Most High on his ministry. That's not to say that he didn't experience opposition and hardship uh, when he was in Dublin, uh, Ireland was a very, obviously, still in a sense, very Roman Catholic. People would throw rocks at him, mud at him, excrement at him. But he was undaunted. He just kept preaching. He just kept preaching. Nothing would daunt him from proclaiming the excellencies of Jesus Christ. Some of the places he went to preach, people would cover the walls with offensive graffiti. Vile, abusive comments were made about him. One commentator in the press said, because people thought that religion should be dignified. Religion was good, but it needed to be civil. It needed to be communicated with decorum. One commentator in the national press in Scotland wrote, Burns preaches with daring blasphemy. He's a scandal on religion and a disgrace to our city. He was echoing the public ministry of his Savior, Jesus Christ. In 1847, the English Presbyterian Church, and th there were reasons why it happened this way. The English Presbyterian Church approached 
burdens. Now, burdens for long knew that God was one day going to send him overseas. He thought it would be to India, but it turned out to be China. Probably from the time he was converted at the age of 16, which would be then in the year um, 1831, his heart and mind were fixed on going to the ends of the earth. He didn't know where, but he wanted to take the gospel to where it had never gone before. In 1847, when Hudson Taylor was yet 15 years of age, Hudson Taylor, I hope you know. How many of you heard of Hudson Taylor? Well, there you go. Well, listen to this next bit, and you'll then see why you should know as much about William Chalmers Burns as you do about Hudson Taylor. The English Presbyterian Church asked William, are you willing to go to China? Yes. When can you go? Tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow, tomorrow. God had been preparing him for years. Preparation, Burns didn't expect it to take that long. And I'm not saying, and I'll maybe touch on this, I should watch my time, I just could go on and on here. Um, I'm not saying you need to spend eight, nine, ten years preparing before you go. But that's the way it was with, with Burns. God, God was preparing him internally that he might be able to use him maximally in the great land of China. 1847, he set sail for China. His own minister, a man called John Rabbi Duncan, called Rabbi because he had a phenomenal facility in Hebrew, could not only read it, uh, he, he, he could preach in it, he, you know, he knew it inside out. Duncan said to him, take care of his cause and he will take care of your interests. Burns goes to China. He arrives 1848. It's a six-month journey. During that journey, he begins the arduous work of becoming fluent in Chinese, first of all in Mandarin, then in Cantonese, and then in a number of different dialects. I don't think he reached the 19 uh, Hindi variants that William Carey. William Carey used to relax reading Hindi grammars. Um, I actually find it very relaxing reading a Hebrew grammar. You know, if, if you really want to keep awake in a plane journey, buy a Hebrew grammar. It's, it's really good fun, you know, it's, it's good fun. Um, so he goes to China and he's, he, he, he's a remarkable linguist. He, he has, there are, you know, there are some people who just take to languages. It's just, and he was one of those men. And Burns, for the first year, spends his time on the coast um, because missionary work was all done along the eastern seaboard in China. No one ventured inland. You weren't really allowed to go. You were actually forbidden to go inland. It was thought to be too dangerous. Uh, people were too barbaric. Um, various laws were passed. And so for the first year, as, as, as he um, gave himself hour after hour after hour to, um, to learning the, the language, Mandarin, Cantonese, and these various dialects, but all the time, Burns is longing to go to where no one else had gone before. And so, around about the end of 1849, he leaves the security of the coastal mission stations to preach the gospel inland. And the early years were marked with, with difficulties and discouragements. Burns saw himself more as an evangelist than as a settled pastor. His, his, his great vision 
was to see people one to Christ, and then he would disciple men that he believed God was raising up to be leaders because he wanted living gospel churches to be planted. But he always wanted, a bit like the Apostle Paul, to, to, to be moving on, to be moving on to the next place. But he wanted to do so leaving the, the, the number of converts in the, in the safe hands of men that he had personally discipled. But there were difficulties and discouragements. But in 1854, he, he was involved in a remarkable work of God at Tem Pekua, or however you pronounce it in Mandarin, near Amoy, uh, north of what would be today modern-day Hong Kong. And quite a number of native Chinese congregations were formed. But Burns's burden, as I said, was, was to go into the hinterland of China. In 1854, he was asked to return to Scotland with a sick friend. There was a, another Scottish uh, missionary, a doctor, who had gone out to China. He was very unwell. And Burns was asked, will you be willing to go back to Scotland with the sick brother? And Burns agreed. He returned to Scotland, the sick brother died, and immediately Burns went back to China. He was in Scotland for one month. In 21 years, he was home once for one month. And when his mother saw him, he had been away by this time six years, but it seemed to her that he had aged 26 years. But his spirit was indomitable. It was vibrant. She could see that this was a work that God had entrusted to her son. That was his only furlough, his only furlough in 21 years. During that time, he returns then to China, um, late 1854, and he encounters James Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor was a young man. He was 14 years um, Burns's junior. Uh, and I could give you quote after quote from Hudson Taylor. He had never met a man like Burns. His life was fragrant, Hudson Taylor said. He was a saint above all saints. He was a man who lived to pray. I hate hearing those words because they're so condemning of me. He lived to pray. He didn't just pray, it said pr prayer was his native air, if you like. And he so profoundly influenced Hudson Taylor by his godliness, his resolve, his courage. And really, it was through Burns's convictions that Hudson Taylor was left. And they worked together for about 18 months or so, perhaps almost two years. And Hudson Taylor was deeply influenced by, by Burns. But at the same time, Hudson Taylor influenced Burns because Hudson Taylor began to wear Chinese dress and the Chinese pigtail. He realized that he needed to shed his culture. He needed to identify with the people to whom he was going. He knew that he needed, above all, to, to master the language as much as he would be able to master it. And, and to speak it like a native, that, that's, that's maybe not the heights to which every missionary will rise. But that should be the aim. And so he began to adopt Chinese. And this was scandalous. People thought this was so demeaning to, to Western missionaries because they had absolutized their culture. Burns began to translate parts of the Bible. Now, there was a Chinese Bible, uh, Robert Morrison, 
Scottish blood running through him, had um, a Chinese Bible earlier in the 19th century. But Burns began to translate parts of the Scriptures, especially the Psalms. The Psalms are very special to Scots people in the Presbyterian tradition, because up until the 1880s, um, the Scottish church only sang Psalms. In fact, our daughter's congregation in Edinburgh, they still only sing Psalms. Um, now, I don't think you should just sing Psalms, but the Psalter, when, when we neglect the Psalter, we neglect biblical Christianity. Now, that's a strong statement. Do you know that 40% of the Psalter is made up of laments? 59 of the 150 Psalms are laments. That, that's a huge proportion. Every Sabbath day, the Lord Jesus Christ would sing laments. And you know why? Because the life of faith is hard. <laughs> it's difficult. And if we didn't have the Psalter, what would poor, depressed, sad Christians have to sing? We, we, we need the Psalter. And, and so Burns wanted his Chinese converts to know the Psalter. He translated the Psalter and a number of hymns into Mandarin, and also Pilgrim's Progress. There had been a translation of Pilgrim's Progress earlier in the century in Chinese, but it was a bit stilted, and Burns wanted the vibrancy. If you've, how many of you have read the Pilgrim's Progress? Well, you should all read Pilgrim's Progress. Another must read. Um, one of my students, well, not my class of students in Edinburgh once complained that I was telling them there were too many books they had to read. Um, I told them to get a life. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that, that was my three-word response to the vice principal. Um, tell them to get up earlier and go to bed later. Um, but he, he, he translated the Pilgrim's Progress because that book had been impactful on him as a young lad, he, he wasn't converted, as we said, till he was about 16. But he felt the Pilgrim's Progress with its, its, its vibrancy, its color, its drama, was, was well suited to the, the thinking and the imagination of the Chinese. How much time have I got left here? I've lost track of time. When, when, when do we finish? Okay, that's fine. Um, I've got 10 minutes or so. Oh, well, I had to hurry, hurry up. So, um, <laughs> Burns always sought to build a Chinese church that was self-supporting, self-governing, and self-propagating. And I should have said that the, the, the hymns and the psalms that he translated, he did so in the spoken dialect. Um, he, he, he understood that um, if we're going to translate the, the scriptures and Christian theology in, in all its different forms, and hymnology should be deeply theological. It, it should be in the spoken dialect that, that would resonate with people. Uh, because previously, there, there were a lot of hymns, actually, in Mandarin, but they were written in a language that the better educated Chinese preferred. But Burns wanted to reach, if you like, the common people. And he wanted, therefore, to, to publish psalms, hymns, Pilgrim's Progress in a style they understood and that resonated with them. I do need to hurry on. He died March the 4th, 1868, in Nui Chang. And his last words were actually very memorable. You often wonder what your last words might be. His last words were these, thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. So what lessons can we learn, just as we draw to a close, what lessons can we learn from the life of William Chalmers Burns? Number one, he went to China eight years after the church set him apart to preach the gospel. Eight years. 
Now, as I said earlier, I, I'm not saying that such a long time of preparing and waiting should be the norm. What I am saying is that ordinarily years of personal and ecclesial preparation. In the New Testament, you couldn't be considered a Christian if you were not baptized and didn't belong to a local congregation. I don't mean by that that you people weren't Christian. You couldn't be considered a true believer if you were not baptized. Every Christian has to be baptized and belong to a local congregation. In these eight years, Burns is being prepared by God. And preparation is necessary and vital to fit a man or woman to be an effective servant in, in any area of life, and perhaps above all in missionary life. Think of Moses. He, he, he was 40 years, as the King James puts it, in the backside of the desert. 40 years. Doing what? Well, he was tending sheep. But God was making him a man that he could safely use. The Apostle Paul, he spent so many years, we're told, in Arabia. Or think of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you've got time, go back to the second servant song that we heard about this morning. Isaiah 49, he, he hid me in his quiver. He hid me away. What, what was the Lord doing for the 30 or so years before the Savior came on the scene and declared, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and he's baptized. What was he? He's being prepared. You see, there are no shortcuts in the economy of God. No shortcuts. The Holy Spirit indeed is given to help us, Romans 8, 26. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. But the word that Paul uses is a double Greek compound, synantilambanitai, a 17-letter word that translates help. You know, you know, what's going on here? Well, it's got this wonderful double nuance. The Holy Spirit comes alongside us. But then the next compound says, he stands over against us. And you think, hmm. What is that soon together with and yet anti over against us? The point is, we are never passive in the Christian life. The Holy Spirit doesn't pick us up. You know this thing about, I, I saw only one set of footprints in the sand? Hokey, hokey, hokey. <laughs> the Spirit says, we're going to do it together. You take that end, I'll take this end. We'll do it together. Now, that's not synergism. It's not syncretism. Because what we discover later is every virtue we possess and every victory won and every thought of holiness are His alone. That's why when we're given crowns, we cast them at His feet. We never let go and let God. We're to give ourselves to preparation. Second lesson, if you've not deeply felt the lostness of the lost at home and given yourself to seeking their salvation, it's doubtful if you should contemplate seeking the lost overseas. That's why it's so vital for the local church to be vitally involved, that this person want, be, believes God's calling them to go where, wherever, do we see that they have a heart for mission? Can we see in the life of the local church that they're always seeking to reach the lost, win the lost, pray for the lost? Thirdly, if you're not committed to giving God no rest in prayer here, it's doubtful if you're fit to go to the ends of the earth with the gospel. I, I've, I've thought of these words a lot in the last few years. And, you know, some passages in the Bible are horrible to read. They, the Bible is... The Bible is very dismantling. And this is a passage that I'm often compelled to read, but 
to be honest, I hate to read, and the reason is obvious. On your walls, O Jerusalem, Isaiah 62, I have set watchmen all day and all the night. They shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest. Give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise in the earth. Give him no rest. Benjamin Warfield, the great Princeton theologian, was once asked, um, what is Calvinism? The great answer. I wonder what, do you know what he answered, how, how he replied? Anyone remember Benjamin Warfield? What is Calvinism? Christianity on its knees. Christianity on its knees. That's why the church today, our great need is not better methods, more organization, novel methods. We need men and women of prayer. We need churches that gather together for prayer. There was a day when congregational prayer was a vital reality in evangelical churches. I hardly know of a Reformed church in America that has a congregational gathering for prayer. Evening services are dying. You know, it's the Lord's day, not the Lord's half day, you know. Um, E.M. Bounds wrote, the Holy Ghost does not flow through methods, but through men. He does not come on machinery, but men. He does not anoint plans, but men, men of prayer. And then finally this, if you're not willing to die to your own culture to win the lost, it's doubtful if you should be considering missionary service. Uh, I mentioned Burns wore Chinese dress. Um, he made himself of no reputation. Philippians 2.7. It's not a great translation of the Greek, actually. He out on ekonosin, himself he emptied literally, but himself he emptied. And what's the next word? Remember? present participle, taking. It's, it's uh, subtraction by addition. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. But the KJV, it's not the best translation, but it captures, it captures the heart of what the Savior did. He made himself of no reputation. He, he laid aside all the outward insignia of his majesty and glory, such that when people looked at him, they just saw him as a man to be despised and rejected, the creator of the cosmos. He made himself burns of no reputation. He stooped to serve. But I want to finish with this. Please, please, please do not believe the lie that everything American or Western is bad. Yes, our first allegiance is to our servant king. The word became flesh. He became what he was not, that we might become what we were not. But there's this lie that's perpetrated that, you know, when we go abroad, we've got to get rid of all our Britishness and Americanness. Well, there's, there's truth in that. But as we were hearing earlier from Aubrey and from Chad, the great truths of the gospel are not American. They, they didn't start in 1776 when you rebelled against our king. <laughs> Do you know that a Scottish Presbyterian was the only clergyman to sign the Declaration of Independence? All tell me in concert his name, John Witherspoon from Glasgow. Of course, we need to shed whatever is going to hinder the proclamation of the gospel. But don't believe the lie that simply because it's American or Scottish or British or German or whatever, that, you know, it must therefore be bad. Um, it is biblical, it's good. And 
William Chalmers Burns. He's not well known, relatively, compared to, say, Hudson Taylor, who's, who did a remarkable work. And of course, the China Inland Mission came out of that, and then the Overseas Missionary Fellowship as it exists today. But go away. Um, there's a couple of biographies. There's the large one by his brother, Eileen Burns. There's a, a modern one by Michael Mullen, God's Polished Arrow. Wouldn't think I'd read it, would you? Um, William Chalmers Burns, born 1815, died 1868, of whom this world was not worthy. Thank you for your patience for listening.